Girls and boys, an assembled company. Welcome to the World Storytelling Cafe. And it is Friday night, so it's stories for children. And we have all the way from Canada, the North great Norman Perrin. Well, I'm here at New Forest Folk Festival, and I have two children here who are going to shout and cheer and clap. Say, hello, Norman. Right, okay. So, Norman, will you tell us a story? I think I will. Now, uh, I'm going to hear Norman tell a story. Now, I would like to have some help I've, with I've, this I've only got, story. I've only got, a, oh, just, I'm going to mute. Okay, then. This story I'm about to tell. Now, if you may have noticed, John made a, a very rare, rare error. I am not from Canada at present. I am in Walkerburn, Scotland, and a lovely area to be. And uh, but the story I am about to tell um, is a Canadian story. Now, a long time ago, in the country of Canada, there was a young man by the name of Guscabi, and Guscabi. Well, sometimes he was wise, sometimes he was foolish, and sometimes he needed a lot of help from his grandmother, Woodchuck, because he was always getting into trouble. And he had to, but he was a good man, and he, he provided food for his uh, grandmother and by going out and hunting. And in those days, hunting was hard, hard, hard work. He would go chasing after the deer, and were the deer slowly sitting around waiting to become dinner? Do you think they just sat there and said, hey, let's be dinner? What did they do? As soon as they saw Gluskabi, they, what did they do? They ran away. And deer are very fast. And Gluskabi had to run very, very fast. And it was a hot day and he could not catch anything at all that day and so he came back to his grandmother woodchuck and said grandmother hunting is very hard whenever the deer see me and i'm supposed to go hunting they run away why can't they just stop there and wait and let me go and catch them for dinner and grandmother woodchuck said well my grandson they are there to be fast and swift so you can learn to be fast and swift so when, like the children, when they run after each other, they become very strong and very fast indeed. Well, grandmother, grandmother, I am going to have to think of a better way to go hunting. And I am going to think about it until I have a better idea. And Skluskabi went and he sat in a corner. And he sat and he sat and he thought and he thought and he sat and he sat and he thought some more. And then he had an idea. Grandmother, grandmother, I've had an idea. Oh, that's very good, my grandson. And what is your idea? Well, I want a game bag. For you see, it's hard to carry those deer all by myself. And if I had a bag to put them into, well, it, easier, it would be easier for me to come home with that deer. Oh, said Grandmother Woodchuck, I will do that for you. I'll make one out of ah i will take the hide of a of a bear and she took the hide of a bear she plucked all that fur off the hide of the bear and she plucked and she plucked and she plucked and then she took the fur and she made it into thread and she took the thread and she made the thread into cloth and then she took that cloth she cut and she sewed a beautiful bag and Guskabi took that beautiful bag made from the fur of a bear. He looked inside and he said, Grandmother, Grandmother Woodchuck, this is not the bag that I want. Well, she said, then I will have to do you something else. And this time she took the hide of a moose, big moose, lots of fur, pluck, pluck, pluck all that fur, pluck, 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 spun all that fur into thread, spin, 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 until she had a long thread, just like the one you're holding uh, in your hands. And then she took that thread and she wove it into cloth. 
And then she took the cloth and she cut it. And then she sewed it into a bag, a beautiful bag. And Gustav, he looked at the bag and said, Grandmother, this is a beautiful bag, but not the one I wanted. So Grandmother would just try it again. This time, this time she took the hide. Oh, there, fox, and a deer. And she plucked and plucked and plucked and plucked and plucked and plucked and spun and spun and spun and spun and spun and wove and wove and wove and wove and she cut and cut and cut and she sewed that cloth made from the hide of a deer into a beautiful bag. And Gluskabi took that bag, he looked inside of it and said, Grandmother, this is not the bag that I want. What kind of bag do you want? Ah, said Gluskabi. I want a very special bag, Grandmother Woodchuck. I would like you to make me a bag from the fur of a woodchuck, Grandmother Woodchuck. For a while, Grandmother was silent. To make a bag out of her very own fur would be a very difficult thing. But she said, Grandma, grandchild, grandson, if this is what you want, I will make it for you. And so that's what Grandmother Woodchuck did. She plucked all the fur off of her own belly. She plucked and she plucked and she plucked. And then she took that fur and she spun, she spun, she spun and spun it into thread. And then she took the thread and she wove and wove and wove the thread into a cloth. And then from that cloth, she cut and sewed the most beautiful bag in the world. It was beautiful because she decorated it. She decorated it with colored porcupine quills of red and yellow and green and blue in patterns of like stars and spirals and circles until when she was finished, it was the most beautiful bag you ever saw. And she gave that bag made with her own fur to the um, to Guskabi. And he looked at that bag. It was beautiful on the outside. He looked inside the bag and he smiled and he said, Grandmother, this is the bag I wanted all along. So Uskabi took the bag and he went into the forest. He walked into the center of the forest. In the center of the forest, there's a huge rock. And he climbed to the top of the rock and he called out, All the animals, all you animals of the world, Come to the edge of the great green clearing, and I have terrible news for you. And Guskabi's voice was heard by all of the animals of the world. And all of the animals of the world came from the north and from the south and the east and the west, and they gathered around that huge rock. And then they said, Guskabi, Guskabi, what news do you have? What terrible news? And Gluskabi said, I have terrible news indeed. My grandmother has said that the world is going to fall apart into little pieces. And there will be nowhere that you can hide or be safe except inside this bag that my grandmother made for you and for me. So we will be safe because this bag is bottomless. You can all fit into this bag. And the animal said, oh, Guskabi, thank you. Thank you for making a, a place for giving us a place where we'll be safe when the world falls apart. And so all of the animals went into the bag. From the north, there came the polar bears. From the south, there came the alligators. From the west, there came the buffalo. From the east, there came the deer. And they all crowded into the bag. And the very last animal was a little hamster. And when the hamster was inside the bag, Muscavi tied up that bag and lifted it up. And it was as light as a feather, for it was truly a magic bag. And then he took the bag and he went back to his grandmother Woodchuck. Grandmother Woodchuck looked up from her uh, sewing and she said, my grandson, you are back early today from the hunting. It must have been very good hunting indeed. Oh, yes, said Gluskabi. 
It was so, the hunting was so good that we will never have to hunt again. Uh-huh, said Grandmother Woodchuck. What have you done this time, my grandson? Oh, Grandmother, what do you think? I, I, you sound like I did something wrong. All I did was trick all of the animals of the world into this bag. And so whenever we want something to eat, all I have to do is pull out one of the animals and we have something to eat. Pull out another animal for fur and, oh, grandmother, I will never have to hunt again. Uh-huh, said grandmother woodchuck. And what's going to happen to the animals inside that bag when it's tied up tight? Is there any food for the animals in that bag? Is there any water for the animals inside that bag? Is that, is there any air for the animals inside that uh, bag? No, said Gusgabi. I don't think I should have to feed them. And water, it takes a lot of water to give to all the animals of the world. And if the bag is tied up tight, they won't be able to, what will happen to them? They can't breathe. You are there on a beautiful tent, smelling the sweet air and the wind is blowing. But inside this bag, all of the animals will die. Oh, grandmother, said Goose Gabby. Oh, go grandmother, I'm so sorry that I made a terrible mistake. Yes, said grandmother, you know the right thing to do. Yes, said Goose Gabby. And Goose Gabby took that bag, went into the forest, untied the bag, called out into the bag, all you animals of the world, I, Gluskabi, have wonderful news. My grandmother, she gave me some glue, and I took all the pieces of the world that fell apart, and I glued them all back together again. And so the, come out, my friends, the world is safe for you now because of my grandmother. And all the animals came out of the world. Out came the buffalo to the west, and the deer to the east, and to the south, the glass, the, um, to the alligators, and to the north there were the polar bears. And the very last animal out was, what do you think the last animal out was? The hamster. And the hamster came out and said, oh, Guscapi, Oh, the world looks wonderful. It's as if, nope, it had never been broken up in the first place. Oh, it was nothing, said Gusgabi. And the hamster said, thank you, Gusgabi. Thank you, my friend. And the hamster went off and to the south. And when the hamster was gone, Gusgabi took up his bow. He picked up his arrows and he sighed, <sighs> hunting was such hard work. And he went off into the forest to find something to eat for his grandmother. And he didn't find any animals that day. But that day, he picked a huge, big bag of blueberries. Blue, sweet, tasty blueberries. And he took those blueberries to his grandmother, Woodchuck, and they had a feast of blueberries. And they tasted so sweet. And so that is the story of Gustavi's game bag. When he tried to steal and take everything of the whole world and realized sometimes that is not always a good thing to do. But he did get a lot of blueberries out of it. And that's that story. Hi, John. I thank you, Norman. That was a fantastic story. Ah, yeah. right. If I go, I, I no. might go to my band now because um, my bat my battery is going going to run out. Do you want to wave goodbye? There we go. Okay. Right. Carry on. Another story. Did the children just leave? Yeah. Um, they, well, they, one story was enough. I'd already told them two. So. Okay, uh, that's good because. I was seeing mostly to the tops of their heads. 
Well, that and, was intentional. Um, I'm not <laughs> used to telling stories to like that, so I had to trust that they were listening. Hello, just no, they were listening. They were listening all the, all the way through. But I only good. I'm glad to hear. I couldn't tell. No, I know. But, um, well, as I hadn't asked parents' permission, I didn't like to show their faces too much. So. Uh, Ah, uh, fair enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if so, you had, yeah, if you'd wanted another story, I did have one uh, ready. Well, no, you. The, we'll have another story from you, but uh, I just have to go and uh, you carry on. I shall go and make sure the phone doesn't give up. I'm as I'm broadcasting okay. from the middle of a field. Okay. Well, this story um, did start in North America, back where I come, where I live. I am currently in Scotland right now. And uh, so I thought I would uh, give a truth in advertising. But this next story I'm about to tell comes from uh, Germany. And it's a story, well, stories about animals are a favorite of mine. And I've always liked this one. It's called the Bremen Town Musicians. A long time ago, a long, long, long time ago, but not so long that there weren't donkeys everywhere. And this was a donkey on a farm a hard working donkey and each day the donkey would uh, be taken out to the field to pull the plow for for plowing in the spring uh, to haul water to water the crops and then in the fall when harvest came the uh, wagon would be loaded with turnips and potatoes and and carrots and all sorts of good things that the farm had provided now, I do not know if it was because on this particular harvest that the wagon was extra heavy, the donkey was extra tired, but when the donkey was hitched up and the donkey went, pull, oh! the wagon did not move. And the farmer picked up a stick and he hit that poor donkey, move, he called to the donkey, and the donkey pulled and the wagon did not move oh that's getting to be an old old donkey said the farmer i think it's time to take him into bremen town and and see if i can get some money for him as glue the donkey heard this and he thought glue i've worked hard all these years i don't want to be turned into glue and the donkey kicked and he kicked and he kicked and he broke the harness and he went clip clop clip clop clip clop down the road and he ran away from that farm then he stopped and he looked all around. There was the sky filled with beautiful clouds and blue. And he thought to himself, it's a wonderful world, but what am I going to do? Here I am in the great wide world and I don't know what I'm going to do. And the donkey thought for a moment. And then he thought, I have a beautiful singing voice. And I've heard that in the town of Bremen, they will give gold for those who sing songs. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to Bremen town and I am going to sing for my fortune. And so the donkey went down the road, clip clop, clip clop, clip clop, singing to himself. I'm going down to Bremen town, my fortune for to find. And if I'm clever and if I'm bold, I'll find my treasure of shining gold. But being a donkey, what did he sound like? What do you think he sound like, Despina? He sounded just like this. Hee-haw, hee-haw. While the donkey went clip-clop, clip-clop down the road singing until he met a dog in the middle of the road. And the dog, no, the dog was in a ditch and the donkey stopped and he looked at the dog in the ditch he says, oh, dog, dog, why are you lying there in the ditch? The dog looked up from that voice, from that ditch, and he said in a very sad and very sorrowful voice, oh, donkey, it's a terrible story I have to tell, but it's short in the telling. I have been guarding this farm for many years from robbers and, and wolves and, and nasty things in the woods, but now my teeth are all fallen out and the farmer said it's time to get rid of that dog and the farmer took a stick and he beat me until i ran away and here i am 
in a great wide world, and I don't know what I'm going to do. Oh, said the donkey. Well, why don't you join me? I am going down to Bremen Town, and I'm going to sing for my fortune. Have you got a singing voice? The doggy jumped out of the ditch, wagged his tail, and said, I've got a singing voice, the best singing voice. The dog took a deep, deep breath, and this is what the dog sounded like. Beautiful, said the dog. I said the donkey. That's just what we need for our Bremen Town musicians, a baritone. And so they went they, down the road, clip clop, clip clop, down the road singing, We're going down to Bremen Town, our fortune for the fine. And if I'm clever and for bold, if we're bold, we'll find our treasure of shining gold. But what they really sound like was, hee haw. Well, they came down the road and they met a sheep in the road, middle of the road. And he said, oh, sheep, what do you hear out here in the great right, wide world? And the sheep looked at him. He said, I, I, I have a terrible story to tell. For many years, I've been giving my wool to the farmer and they've cut it and they've made it into yarn. But this year they said my wool was too thin and they said that I was going to become mutton stew and I don't want to be mutton stew and so I've run away and here I am in the great wide world and I I don't know what I'm going to do and the donkey said oh sheep have you got a singing voice oh yes oh yes said the sheep the sheep took a deep breath and went meh, 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 meh. oh what a beautiful voice said the donkey just what we need for our Bremen Down musicians. And, uh, oh, <laughs> and so they went down, clip clop, clip clop, down the road singing, we're going down to Bremen Town, our fortune for to find. And if we're clever and if we're bold, we'll find our treasure of shining gold. And of course, you know what they sound like. <laughs> well, they traveled along until they came to a fence post and on top of the fence post there was a cat and the cat was standing sitting there looking off into the distance and the donkey stopped and he said hey well, cat why are you standing there on that fence post and the cat turned around and looked at the donkey and for a while it was quiet and then it said well not that it's any of your business but well this morning when i went to pounce on a mouse I missed the mouse and the farmer said I was getting too old. And so the farmer took me, grabbed me by the scruff of my neck, threw me into a barrel of water and I scratched and I kicked and I bit and I scratched some more and I ran away. Here I am now in the great wide world and I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, you know what the donkey said next, of course. Have you got a singing voice, oh sweet cat? Of course I've got a singing voice, said the cat. I'm a cat after all. And the cat took a deep breath and the cat went. Beautiful, beautiful, said the donkey. Just what we need for our Bremen Town musicians, a soprano. And so they went tip. Cut, tip, clop, clip, clop, down the road singing. We're going down to Bremen Town, our fortune for to find. And if we're clever and if we're bold, we'll find our treasure of shining gold. And of course, you know what they sounded like. Then as they were traveling along, they came close to the forest. And as they came close to the forest, they saw a rooster. And there was the rooster just standing there with his tail feathers, all dribble drabble in the dust of the road. And the donkey stopped. He said, my friends, here is a rooster. Why are you here, rooster? And the rooster looked at the uh, donkey and said, it's a sad story. It's a sad story I have to tell. This morning I lost my voice and because I could not wake up the farm workers anymore, well, the donkey, they were going to make rooster soup out of me.
and I don't want to be rooster soup. And so I've flown away and here I am, the great wide world, and I don't know what I'm going to do. Have you got a singing voice? Asked the donkey. Of course, said the rooster. I've got my voice back. I drank some clear water and I found my voice once again. And the rooster flapped its wings, shook the dust off its tail feathers, took a deep breath and went, ah, ah, no, no, no. Beautiful, said the donkey. Just what we need for our Bremen town musicians. And so they went clip clop, clip clop, clip clop down the road and they went into the forest. And it was dark now. The sun had gone down and it was scary. And there was monsters and trolls and all sorts of evil creatures in the forest. And they huddled together until and traveled forward until at last they saw a light. And the donkey said, look, there's a light. Where there's light, there's people. And where there's people, there is food. And I don't know about you, my friends, but I am hungry. And so they uh, followed the light through the darkness until they came to a beautiful, huge house. And, but they did not know though, it was the house of robbers who had been robbing people going through the forest. And they were sitting down to dinner and the donkey was about to knock on the door when the donkey said, stop, we are not uh, beggars. We are buskers and we shall sing for our supper. And so he said to all of the animals, I want each one of you to sing your very best and they will reward us for our singing. And so the dog and the sheep and the cat and the rooster and the sheep all took a deep, 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 deep breath and went, And inside the robbers who were sitting down to dinner thought every monster, ogre, and troll in the forest was banging on their front door. And so they all ran away. They ran out the windows through the back door. And I mean, they went through the back door. And then there was silence. And after a bit of silence, the donkey said, well, nobody has come out, let us go in. And so they opened the door and there they found the feast, but nobody was there. The donkey said, look, all this food. They must have liked our singing. They gave us this food as a reward. And so let us eat and feast. And that's what they did. They ate and they drank and they drank and they ate until they could eat no more. And when they were finished eating, they went exploring. And as they went exploring, they did not find anybody in the house, but they did find rooms full of gold and silver and jewels, treasures beyond measure. And so the donkey said, look, they must have liked our singing so much, they left all of this treasure for us. And so they decided to settle down in that house. And they knew that it, all those treasures were a gift for them because they never saw the farmers, I mean, the robbers ever again. And so after the end of each day of work, because there's always work to be done, of cleaning up and gardening and all sorts of good things, they would have their feast. And after they finished their feast, they would go outside and build a bonfire. They would gather around that bonfire and then they would sing their favorite, favorite song. And it went like this, of course. We're, we're going down to Bremen town, our fortune for to find. And we've been clever and we've been bold and we found our treasure of shining gold. That's that story. And I know it's a true story. I went through there and the, uh, the, the, I ate, sat down to eat with him, but I made such a pig of myself. The donkey gave me a kick. He kicked me so hard. I went flying through the air and I landed here in Walkerburn, Scotland. True story. Well, it's good to see, see you both. Uh, and, um, 
Oh, okay. Uh, I, I, I'm not too sure what to say. Despina, nice to chat with you for a moment, if you could. So it'd be nice to see how things are going. Hey there, how are you? Yeah. I'm doing all right. I've had a few problems here. I put my back out. Um, and but they um but i've been some medication and the, the stiffness is i can walk that's a good thing well and, um, walk into the next story then norman okay you want another story well we have 14 minutes left of the program oh so okay then of course of course I you're live you're not li you're oh. like you, in case you've forgotten, you're going out live on the World Storytelling Cafe, Norman. Hello, World Storytelling Cafe. It's good to it's good to see you all. I will take. I know it's, I, I know it's very hot, there. and one and one tends to forget where one is. But uh, you're in Scotland. We're in the World Storytelling Cafe. Mm. I'm in the New okay. Forest, and this winner is in Greece. Okay, uh, good. Uh, now, uh, okay. Walid, Walid's in Morocco. So right. we, okay, we, we have, we, we're like the musicians of Bremen. We're all over the place. That's but, right. Um, okay. okay. I did promise in a little bit um, uh, to give a riddle. So I would like to give the, uh, the two of you of this riddle or anybody who's hearing. And this is the riddle. I, I am the beginning of eternity. I, I am the end of time and space. I am the start of everything. I am the end of every place. Who am I? I'm the beginning of eternity. I am the end of time and space. I am the start of everything and the end of every place. I've given you, the, by the way, the answer in every line. Is it time or is it I? You're getting close, but you got the wrong letter of the alphabet. It must be E then. That's right. E. <laughs> and the uh, beginning of eternity is the letter E, and so on and so forth. Nice. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Well, now I'm going to do is I have a, since you were, have that uh, riddle in hand, and then I must give you the next story. And this has got singing in it as well, but um, it's all to do with a turtle. Now, some people may not think that turtles sing, but that is an important part of this story. But it doesn't begin with a turtle. It begins with Jean-Pierre's vegetable garden. And every day the birds, the pigeons would fly into Jean-Pierre's vegetable garden and eat and feast. It was a big garden, but my Jean-Pierre would come out with his big stick and yell and wave and about and the, and the birds would fly off. But um, now each day, little turtle would watch the birds fly over into the garden and feast upon the vegetables there. But you know what? He wanted a taste of those vegetables, those carrots and those broccoli and all sorts of good things, but he couldn't get into the garden. So, and uh, now the birds got tired of listening to the turtle complain. So they said, they came up with a plan. They said, okay, turtle, we've heard you say you want to fly into the garden. We know you can't, uh, you can't fly but we're going to give you a gift. In fact, we're going to give you a lot of gifts. Each one of us is going to give you a small handful of feathers and a bit of glue. And so the birds all gave Turtle a handful of feathers and a bit of glue, and Turtle glued those feathers onto his shell and onto his legs and onto his head. And so when he had done this, all the birds went to fly off Turtle was able to fly with him. And he flapped his uh, legs and he flapped his tail and he flapped his heads and he flew through the air into Jean-Pierre's vegetable garden. And they were, yes. Now, the uh, 
Turtle was having such a good time feasting. Turtle forgot the one part, important part of the story, Jean-Pierre. And Jean-Pierre came yelling and screaming and waving that stick around. And the birds flew off like they always did. And their wings flapped and flapped and flapped. And the wind blew. And the wind blew so hard it blew all the feathers off of Turtle's back, his shell, his head, and his legs, leaving poor little Turtle in the middle of Jean-Pierre's garden. Jean-Pierre! Uh, saw the turtle. The turtle tried to run, but you know what? The turtle's not very fast. And so turtle, he grabbed hold of the turtle and Jean-Pierre said, you are one of the ones that have been feasting on my vegetables. And this tonight, I don't think we will have vegetable stew. We're going to have turtle soup uh, with vegetables. So poor, poor turtle. Turtle waved his legs around and his tail and his waggled his head back and forth. But uh, you know what? He didn't know what to do. So whenever Turtle doesn't know what to do, he sings. Golik, and this is what he sang to to Coleco Coleco Jean-Pierre Ho Ho Coleco Jean-Pierre Ho Ho Coleco Jean-Pierre Ho Ho if I had wings, I would fly. Too bad I don't have wings. You can sing, says Jean-Pierre. Eh, a little bit, said the turtle. You can sing. And he says, well, yeah, sing it again. And the turtle sang again. And now that Jean-Pierre knew that he wasn't imagining things, he realized, you're not going to become turtle soup. You're going to become my fortune. And he went back home and he took the turtle to his wife and he, uh, I'm sorry, he took the turtle, put it into his box, and then he gave the box to his wife. And what did he say to his wife? He said, don't open this box. Uh, so, and so the wife took the box, she put it in the living room, and Jean-Pierre went, uh, ran down the road to the town, and there he started to make bets with the people. And what kind of bet did he make? He said, I have a singing turtle. And the people said, Jean-Pierre, there's no such thing. I've got a singing turtle. Jean-Pierre, there is no such thing as a singing turtle. I will bet you, said Jean-Pierre. I'll bet you five gourds. Okay, I'll take that bet, uh, said one man. Another said, I'll bet 10 gourds. Okay, I will take that bet too. And one man said, I will bet a hundred gourds. A well, hundred gourds is a lot of money. But Jean-Pierre remembered that turtle sang, and it sang twice. And so he said, I will take your bet. And so he was taking bet after bet after bet. And through the, but uh, as he was doing this, through the town there came a motorcade of soldiers upon motorcycles. And the motorcycles went by and along came a huge, long, black car. It was the car of El Presidente. And when El Presidente saw all the people uh, huddled together making noise, he stopped the car and sent a soldier out to find out what all the fuss was. And when he heard that it was over a singing turtle, he got out of his long black car. He walked over to the crowd of men. And when the men saw the El Presidente along with the soldiers and their guns, they went silent and they parted away. And there in the middle of the men was Jean-Pierre. El Presidente went up to Jean-Pierre. He said, I have heard, I have heard Jean-Pierre that you have something called a singing turtle. I would like to see such a thing. Uh, 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 yes, there is such a thing, says Jean-Pierre. In fact, we're taking bets that there is such a thing as a, a turtle that can sing. Oh, says uh, El Presidente. Hmm, I'd like to make one a, a bet too. I'll make a bet. I make a bet that of 10,000 gourds that there is no such thing as a singing turtle. And at this, all the men fell silent. Jean-Pierre went pale. 
and but he remembered he remembered the turtle had sung twice and so but one of the men stepped forward braver than the others and he said el presidente with all due respect your honor um you know that there's no such thing as a singing turtle i know there is no such thing as a singing turtle but uh when jump here loses his bet he can afford to pay off a bet of five or or ten or a hundred gourd but ten thousand gourds when he loses that he will never pay that off in ten lifetimes oh very well said el presidente with a grin it went from ear to ear very well if there is no such thing as there is as a singing turtle i'll change my bet if there is a singing turtle he will get the ten thousand gourd but if there is no singing turtle i will have my men take him down to the river and have him shot and at this jean pierre went even paler than before but he remembered remembered that the turtle had sung once and twice there was a singing turtle and so he said very well my el presidente i take the bet he said now we will go down to my place and he turned around and he's walked down the road followed by the soldiers and the presidente towards his house meanwhile back at the house there's that box and jean pierre's wife was looking at the box what could be in the box he had said don't open it up ah <clears throat> it wouldn't hurt to take a peek would it and so she picked up the box she opened it up and she saw a turtle why would my husband put a turtle into a box uh, it's because i can sing said the turtle what you can sing uh, uh yes said the turtle i can sing and that's why i'm in this box well, well, sing for me, said the wife. I, I don't believe you. And she believed that he talked, but singing, no. And he says, the turtle says, oh, well, I, I, uh, my throat is very, very dry. Uh, I, I really can't sing unless I get some water. Um, can you take me down to the water, please? Well, so anxious to hear the turtle sing, she picked up the box. She went down to the river and she opened up the box and said, here, you can see the water. Oh, please, I can see the water, but please put me in. And the turtle said, I will sing for you then. So she took the turtle, put him into the water, and the tur turtle took a deep drink and disappeared underneath the surface of the river water. Just in time for the motorcade, for the soldiers, for El Presidente, for um, Jean-Pierre, and all the men of the town, to arrive. Now, Jean Pierre's wife saw all these coming and she took the box, which was now empty, and she looked around and, 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 and there's no turtle. And then she saw a lizard on a nice warm rock. She grabbed hold of the lizard and she opened up the box, stuffed the box in. Maybe the lizard will sing too. Well, the soldiers came, El Presidente came, the men of the town came, and Jean Pierre. And uh, Jean-Pierre said, wife, bring me the box. And the wife brought the box. And Jean-Pierre took the box and smiling to the El Presidente and smiling at the soldiers with their guns. He said, this is the singing turtle. He opened up the box and there was the lizard. Jean-Pierre looked around. Perhaps the turtle had turned into a lizard. Perhaps the lizard could sing too. He said, sing, O oh lizard. Eh, eh, went the lizard. Sing, lizard, said Jean-Pierre, sweating. Eh, eh, went the lizard. And El Presidente was turned red with rage. Take this fool down to the river and have him shot 
and the soldiers with their guns went down to the edge of the river. They put Jean-Pierre by the edge of the river. He stood there facing the guns bravely, and the soldiers um, took their guns. Present arms! They presented arms. Shoulder arms! They shouldered arms. Ready! Aim! But before the order could be, get, be given to fire, up popped the turtle. Ah, said the turtle. Aha, Jean-Pierre. Whoa, what a joke on you. If you, um, too bad. I'm oh, sorry. Jean-Pierre, the joke is now on you. If you had wings, you would fly, would you not? Colico Jean-Pierre, ho, ho. Colico Jean-Pierre, ho, ho. If you had wings, you would fly. Too bad you don't have wings. And at that, Jean-Pierre said, the turtle sings. And the soldier said, the turtle sings. The men of the town said, the turtle sings. And El Presidente, thinking about the 10,000 gourds he had just lost, began to sweat. And when he sweated and he sweated, uh, the turtle sang once more, Colico El Presidente, Colico El Presidente. Um, stupidity does not kill a man, but it sure makes him sweat. And so he disappeared in, uh, under the water after saying, I have fulfilled my part of the bargain, Jean-Pierre. You do yours. And so the turtle disappeared. The men went back to the uh, period. I'm sorry. The men went back to the town, and the soldiers put their guns away. And El Presidente, he just stood there and sweated. And that's the story of the singing turtle from uh, Haiti. And so if you get us, if you substitute lizards for turtles, you better find out if they sing first before you take such an action. And uh, in fact, I'm not too sure if I've heard any singing, singing turtles uh, out there, but um, who knows? I am in a new land for me. And I'm going to be walking along the Tweed River. And if I hear the sound of singing, I'm going to follow. No, that you song. might hear a singing haggard. A, a singing what? A singing haggis. haggis. Yes, or haggis. Oh, yes. Well, actually, I, I passed a whole pile of singing haggises. Uh, yeah, haggis well, Haggy. Haggy is the plural. Haggy. Oh, yes, a haggy. Yes. And um, now, Norman, you never that, know. Was that was a fantastic session. Uh, I better say yeah, what's coming you. up. Uh, we've got, um, well, obviously, on Tuesday, we have our young international tellers. That's mm -hmm. five o'clock UK and Irish time, British summer time. And next Friday, uh, we have a great storyteller. Marion Leeper is going to be to the children's storyteller for our stories for children next Friday. So, Norman, that was a magnificent session. And you even got oh, two live you. children in my tent um, yeah. for part of it. So, and there's undoubtedly live children all over the place listening to you. So, thank oh, you very much. Thank you, Despina, for coming in. Thank you, Waleed, for uh, flying the magic mm -hmm. carpet. And, thank um, you. And, uh, and I hope to be catching some of the events here. And Stay I hope to see you while troubles. I'm over here. Yeah, thank, thank you, you. Norman. Yeah. Norman. Okay, then. Take good care. Good night, everyone. Okay, Bye-bye. Good night. For once, good I night. am saying good night, not good afternoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah for a change. Yes, bye-bye. Fantastic.